last week. So again, what is the Bible? It's a written revelation of who God is and God's purposes for humanity, through which the Holy Spirit points to the living word, Jesus Christ. And it's the written revelation that nourishes our faith and guides our life together. And remember, we've got two halves of the story, and I don't know if I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to say it as succinctly as Dan did last week, but uh, the Old Testament tells the story of God's action and God's, God's plan and activity prior to Jesus Christ. And then the New Testament tells the story of Jesus, guides the church, and also gives us the lens through which Christians understand the, new, the, the Old Testament. Um, so the Old Testament informs the New, and the New Testament is a lens through which we see the Old. All right. Um, and I just wanted to revisit these. I had a great question uh, about my, my attempt here to say, to remind us that the canon is a collection of works that emphasize God's constancy over consistency, purpose over purity, and transformation over transcription. Uh, this is something someone actually gave me a great question subsequently and said, hey, is that just something you came up with? Um, it seems like there are a lot of churches for whom purity and consistency are really important. <laughs> and um, I, I, um, I, I'm going to give a quick qualified answer to that. I, I, I was really excited that I came up with this. I kind of feel like it was a gift from, uh, from the Spirit um, because for me it's really meaningful and really powerful. But I think it's bigger than me, and I think it's bigger than the Presbyterian Church. Um, I think that historically, um, believers have understood scripture with a lot more of a sense of uh, mystery and metaphor, uh, and really the whole kind of literalist movement, uh, the fundamentalist movement is something that happened um, actually in the early 1900s. Um, so um, uh, yes, and we'll definitely send the slides. Um, so just want to just want to kind of point to that that that's something that um, yes I came up with, and yes with my best estimate um, is representative of um, a much bigger part of the body of Christ. And in fact, it's like super fun for me to be in a relationship with people that actually have roots in the fundamentalist and literalist tradition uh, that on their faith journey come to a place that recognize that that um, the Bible isn't as interested in saying. This is, it doesn't lay things out in like a 10 step yes or no plan. Um, there's a lot more ambiguity and mess in there. And that's actually, I think the gift of it. So I don't wanna get too, uh, too, too, too far off, off track, but that's the kind of question we wanna look at uh, for our final session. So there's a teaser. Um, so I wanted to just go over again, the sort of basic ways that I've segmented each Testament and this time, I actually put the books in there. Sorry, I didn't do that last time. I just held up the book and walked it through you. But um, So remember, we have the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. Um, and that's the beginnings of God's people and the establishment of the covenant in the context of uh, their journey from slavery into freedom. Um, hugely fundamental. Um, the next ones are the historical books. This is the story of God's people as a nation. And uh, there we see Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther with a little asterisk at the end. Um, Esther is just such a great story. Um, the, only, the only book in the Bible that never uses the word God in it. Um, it is the story of the people um, it's actually after, after people have been allowed to return back to their homeland, I'll tell you more about that, Esther remains in the Jewish diaspora community. Um, and so um, uh, that's why she gets an asterisk. You're going to hear more about Esther in a little while. And wrapping up the Old Testament, we have our wisdom literature. And that's where we have Job and Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon. 
And then the Old Testament wraps up with a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of books. And those are our prophets. And remember last time we said that prophets are the truth tellers. They tell the truth about their own time. And then what we find is they, in doing so, reveal uh, the truth about the future. Uh, for those of us in the Christian tradition, they have a lot to reveal about Jesus. Um, and the prophets are usually broken down into the major prophets and the minor prophets. Um, uh, not that they're uh, more or less valuable. It's, it's more about the, um, the, amount, uh, the amount of content that they have. So uh, Isaiah uh, and Jeremiah and, and Lamentations is really almost a continuation of Jeremiah uh, and Ezekiel and Daniel. We're going to hear more about them when we talk about the history. And then we dive into our minor prophets, and their books are usually much shorter. Um, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi say that 10 times fast. Um, we, uh, we will, the great thing about this is they're always listed in the front of your Bible, so you can always return to them. Uh, but I will be talking a little more about when each of them were writing, because that's why today is so important is that our context will reveal a lot about what these prophets were addressing, what was going on in the world that they were addressing. Um, so that's why we're going to spend a little more time with that, and I'll keep my eye on the clock. Hopping into the New Testament, I just decided to go ahead and add Acts with the Gospels. Um, so we've got the Gospels and Acts, writings about Jesus and the Apostles, and the same author that wrote Luke also wrote Acts. And then we have our epistles. And y'all, this is where like, this is where I'm learning. Like I, I, took, I, took, I took a class about Paul's letters in seminary, but I never took a class about the other letters. So I learned some things as well. Um, so um, there are a chunk of books uh, that Paul wrote to congregations. And remember, um, when we think about congregations, it may be more similar to where we are in the pandemic. Uh, reality now, right? So in, in the days that Paul's were writing, there wasn't a church building, right, that people gathered to. That, that would come over time. But first, it was usually gatherings of believers, usually in their homes, sometimes in the synagogues. So Paul would write, to, when, when he's writing to a church, uh, the word is ecclesia, which means gathering. So when Paul's writing to the Romans, it was probably passed from home to home, from synagogue to synagogue. It was much more of a loose network, um, which, is, which is fascinating. So these, these letters are written to communities. And as you'll see, there are some dynamics going on in those communities, some of them beautiful and some of them painful, that Paul wants to address. And when Paul is addressing them, encouraging them, guiding them, sometimes like chiding and scolding them, God, uh, uh, Paul reveals things about Jesus and understandings about Jesus that are useful. So that's what ha what's happening in Romans, in the first and second letter to the Corinthians, in Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and first and second Thessalonians. These are Paul's letters to these groups of people. Um, and then we have Paul's letters to individuals. So we know that Paul wrote a letter, wrote a couple letters to Timothy and to Titus and Philemon. Now, Timothy and Titus, you know, they, they, seem, he seem, they seem to be letters uh, to other people in ministry. So they're great sort of guidance um, to other sort of pastors. Um, uh, Philemon is a really interesting, tiny, tiny book. Uh, addressing a moral issue, um, and and that will, will take us down a, a rabbit hole. Um, but if you ever get curious, read Philemon. It won't take you long, and feel free to shoot me an email or a call and say, hey, I read Philemon like you asked. What the heck is going on there? Um, and then we have, we wrap up with letters from other apostles. Um, and we have several of them are named so James, the Apostle James, from Peter, 1st and 2nd Peter, from John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and from Jude. Uh, there's a little asterisk uh, for Hebrews, uh, because that's, that is like Paul's letters addressed to a community of believers, 
but it never is explicit about who the author is. Um, and it is likely not Paul uh, for a number of reasons that I can, I can share with you if you're interested. But that's a letter from another apostle uh, to a community. Um, and then we're ending with Revelation, the vision of John exiled on an island. Um, by the time Revelation is written, um, the persecution of the church has begun uh, or, or continued. Um, and um, he is writing in that context and sharing a vision that he hears for the future church. So I think I'm going to give a pause right there before diving in. Uh, wave a hand or shoot a text if there's any issue. Welcome, Steve. All right. I'm going to unmute you, Ella. What's, what's up, Ella? Nothing. I'm listening. Oh, just wave a hand. Okay, great, 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 great. Okay, okay. Um, I hope that was a helpful review. Uh, again, I'm not sure about my pacing. Um, but um, we're going to dive in for today. Get ready. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. Um, and this is where I hope this behaves uh, because I want to hop back and forth between two resources. Um, so first in our who, what, when, or I'm sorry, our when, where, and who, <laughs> I want to start with where, okay? And many, many times in our Bible studies, people ask me about um, maps. So we're going to start looking at a big picture map, okay? And then this is going to become useful because so much of the history of the people of Israel um, is impacted by the areas around them. And in fact, they're formed in, through, and by those other areas. And so we're going to take a little bit of time. Uh, what I'm realizing is um, if you can't see my cursor, we're in big trouble. Can you see my cursor moving on this map right now? Okay, great. Phew, because I couldn't figure out how to draw on this. And so that went out the window. So what we want to keep in mind, first of all, is that as, as you've probably heard, there is a promised land and that promised land is a very small strip of land right in here. Do you see that cursor just circling the D and the D? Tiny, tiny, tiny. And there were some times where those boundaries spread a little bit, but in relation to the nations around them, even at its height, the promised land, the land of Israel, God's, God's people, God's nation, was very small, okay? So what I'm going to do is, is walk through just a quick paced kind of history uh, using this landscape, and then I'm gonna hop over to the chart that I put together. I'm so excited to share with you. So if you, um, boy, okay. When we start in Genesis, there's actually a reference to Eden, and there's a reference to the Tigris and the Euphrates. So this is where we're talking about here generally. Um, though when we start in Genesis, it gets a little tricky ge geographically. Um, so what we do know is that Abraham, the first patriarch of God's people, is from Ur of the Chaldeans over here. So God starts working with God's people from a different place. And so from the beginning, God's people are a people on the move. So Abraham takes his family and they travel, 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 travel. And this is the land in which they settle. This is the land that, that God says, I am promising you this land and you will have descendants more than the grains of sand on a, on a beach or the stars in the sky. So the beginning of the story with the patriarchs, Abraham and his family, actually begins on a journey to a land that is given to them. Next, it's important to remember that throughout the biblical witness, Egypt over here remains uh, 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 an empire. Um, 
its its strength sort of you know wanes. Sometimes it's stronger, sometimes it's less strong. We're going to hear about some empires rising and falling, but Egypt Egypt always seems to be hanging around. Um, and even when Rome comes in and occupies Egypt, Egypt Egypt maintains its own own kind of distinct identity. Um, and and early Christian communities that start in Egypt kind of connect with that identity as well, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. So if you remember, the patriarchs, Jacobs and his sons are living here, and then Joseph gets sold into slavery into Egypt. And eventually the whole family moves into Egypt where they experience slavery. We'll get to the when in a minute. I'll have dates for all of you for these, uh, some more precise than others. And then from Egypt, it's time for Pharaoh to let God's people go, for them to be freed from slavery. And they enter into this wilderness, into this wilderness time and place where it's really, really awesome. Like God forms them in the wilderness. That's where they get the law. That's where they learn how to live as a people. That's where they learn how to worship. So they learn the worship rules and the ethical rules. And it's all where they're learning to trust God in the wilderness. So this is a hugely important se season in the life of God's people. And, and you will hear about it again and again when you read scripture. You probably heard about it in Psalm 78. If you were able to read Acts 7, you heard about it in Acts 7. So finally, um, they enter, re-enter into the promised land. And there's a period of sort of conquest when uh, God tells them to kick out the people um, that are already living there, uh, which is a challenging uh, theological proposition, um, and which is actually exactly where I'm at in my reading. Uh, and then they, they spend some time in this um, really functioning as 12 separate tribes. And so they're kind of a confederation. They have judges. They're, they're in the land but they're, they're kind of living their kind of wilderness nomadic existence. Um, and then um, because uh, they're feeling pressure from these other nations, um, over here, uh, we can't, it's not listed on this map, but over here kind of where it's Caesarea and a little further, that's where the Philistines are. So the Philistines are, are attacking them. They're getting attacked from Moab. And so they decide they, they are ready to be they're ready to be a real nation and they pray for a king, even though God says, uh, 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 you're not going to want to do that. And they want it. And so God gives them a king. And so then they enter into the period where they kind of become a, a nation. Um, Saul is the first king, but he doesn't quite unite them all. David is really the one that unites all the tribes. And that's when Jerusalem is established as the capital. Uh, and that, and um, if you remember, uh, so David unites the tribes, becomes the kings. Um, if if you really like Game of Thrones, like read First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. Like it is blood, gore, intrigue, backstabbing, betrayal. It's all in there. Um, that's a part of Israel becoming um, uh, a nation. And David's son, Solomon, is the next king, and he's the one that builds the temple. And it's under Solomon's rule that, um, that the kingdom is, the, the boundaries are the largest, and, and I, we can find a more um, specific map. Uh, I'm doing very vague. The boundaries are always fluctuating, so I'm just using this and going to stay on this. Um, but it's after Solomon's death um, that... Uh, that a civil, essentially a civil war happens shortly after that. And they split into the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. That uh, Southern Kingdom is 10 tribes. And I'm sorry, the Northern Kingdom is 10 tribes. The Southern Kingdom is two tribes, one of which is Judah. So the Southern Kingdom also gets known as Judah. And that's where Jerusalem is located. And the northern kingdom is now known as Israel, which makes it really, really tricky. And so Judah has the temple, and Israel starts to kind of build their own temple in a different place. 
Um, uh, and there's a lot that could be said about that. But essentially, we have two functioning kingdoms for a period of time, sometimes at war with each other, right? Remember? Same people, same tribes, now in serious conflict. Um, and eventually, an empire rises called Assyria. And I'm circling it right now. Assyria comes in and invades Israel and actually just wipes them out and takes them all away. Um, uh, some are left behind, but they become intermingled with uh, other people that sort of the Assyrians import. And so actually, when you hear of fast forwarding to Jesus day, the Samaritans, right? The, the, the Jesus people and the Samaritans don't get along. Uh, it's be, that's the roots of that is, is the Samaritans are the descendants of those people that remained after Israel was destroyed and um, interbred and intermingled with the religion of the people there. Um, so, so Judah, uh, actually, the Assyrians are knocking on the doors of Jerusalem, but uh, do not prevail. And so Judah actually continues as a kingdom for a few more generations. And then that's when we hear about the, the, the Babylon, Babylonians coming in. So here's Babylon right here. I'm circling it. Um, often you hear in the same breath the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, and the Medes. I don't even know how to pronounce it, the Medes. Um, so they're all kind of a part of that kingdom. Um, and they come. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, no, uh, sorry. My brain is. You. You may have heard in popular culture the ten lost tribes of Israel. Um, maybe not, but but when Israel was invaded by Assyria, they 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 were done as a nation. They never reestablished again. So the story of God's people continues through Judah. It's, so it's good to focus that. So when Babylon comes and invades Judah, um, the Judean are taken into exile, and this is a hugely important time in the life of God's people, because up to this point, they identify God with their nation, with their temple, with their capital city, and in the period of exile, it's really a time to reframe how big God is and to start to get some hints about God's purposes in the world beyond their little nation. So just kind of putting that nugget in there. Um, along the way, and, and they're almost way off the map, uh, empires rise and fall, but way over here in what is now modern Iran, uh, Persia comes in and conquers the Babylonians. And King Cyrus decides all those people that have been enslaved by the Babylonians, we're gonna let you come home. So there's the Edict of Cyrus, and, and the people of Judah, God's people, are allowed to come back to Jerusalem and attempt to reestablish their nation and their temple, but it's, it's never the same. Uh, they spend some time uh, even trying to reestablish uh, their feeling pressure uh, from uh, the nations around them. And then, if you remember that name, Alexander the Great from your uh, eighth grade social studies, um, he comes in and takes that Macedonian Empire, and uh, God's people are under the rule of the Greeks for several centuries. And then, if we go over here, the Romans come in. Uh, and so, that really sets the stage for Jesus coming. Um, the, the God's people have been in exile. They're home again, and they're really waiting for that Messiah to reestablish this kingdom. Um, the idea of Messiah is the, is means anointed one, right? And David, David was anointed to be the king. And in many ways, David and David's son Solomon are kind of like the highlight, like the golden years. And so when we're hearing Jesus' people talking about, yeah, you're the Messiah, you're the one who's going to usher in God's kingdom, in their mind, they have the good old days with David. And of course, we know now that the kingdom that Jesus is talking about is 
a different kind of kingdom. So that is the quick history. There are two things that um, just as we're looking at this map, those disciples, so Jesus comes and he, again, he travels in a very small territory. He's walking the ground here. Uh, up, he, he pokes around up in Tyre and Sidon. He's mostly hanging out around Galilee. He comes down to Jerusalem, but this is mostly his territory. Uh, but then his, his, his apostles, his disciples, they're going all over. So within a generation, we hear in the book of Acts and we find uh, in the letters um, that there is a Christian community up here in Antioch. Um, Paul, we're going to hear about Paul of Tarsus. He's from Tarsus, but he was profoundly formed by this church in Antioch. Um, there is a church uh, in Alexandria, in Egypt, very early on. And then we see Paul traveling out. Oh, oh sorry. We see Paul traveling out through uh, this. These, these are the areas in here, Ephesus, uh, Corinth, Philippi. These are the places where Paul is traveling and starting these churches, and then he's writing letters. Sometimes he's writing from Ephesus to the people in Philippi. Um, so, so that's it, it's good to just kind of remember that Paul is using the roads and the networks and the cities that the Romans have established to tell the word, word of Jesus. And there's some speculation that Paul got all the way to Spain. That was his big goal, uh, or to, 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 to Gaul. Um, France. Um, so um, uh, it, it's not verified, but he, he talks about wanting to go there. And it, it doesn't happen in the Bible, but when we get into early Christian history, we, we, are, we found out that like there were, there were monks uh, in China, you know, by, by seven or 800, right? I think you, you heard that there were, there were uh, the Apostle Thomas in India. So those earlier disciples could not be contained by this map. Uh, they, they, they headed out. Um, so I hope that, was, uh, hope that was relatively clear. And what I want to do is I just want to show you this resource. Um, so the Bible begins almost sort of, uh, I'm using the word ancient. Some people use prehistoric. Um, there's the key stories in Genesis 1 through 11 are sort of big mythic human stories. And it's hard to gauge dates around those. Some people try based on generations. But when we move forward, we find actually some really interesting historical and archaeological evidence that verifies some of these more solid dates. So in Genesis 1 through 11, this is the people of God in ancient times. Um, but when we get to Genesis 12 through 50, we're going to focus, God, God's going to focus in on God's, on, on, on the family, right? They really, they really start as a family. And then they, they become tribes as they grow based on that original family. Um, and so in what I've done here is I have kind of listed the theme and the time period um, with the, the accompanying scripture verses, uh, the basic themes or events, and also key people. Um, I know some of you maybe, these, these might be old friends for some of you, um, but I think for people that are just getting to know scripture, it's good to know that Abraham and Sarah were the first people called by God. They were the first patriarchs. Um, Joseph was the one who was sold into slavery in Egypt and remains faithful and ends up bringing, bringing God's people there. So in around 2000, oh, a little note about, did you, I grew up learning the terms uh, BC and AD, right? So BC was before Christ and AD is Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. Um, the historical convention that I learned in seminary uh, is BC, uh, which is B, I'm sorry, BCE, which means before the common era, era and CE, which means the common era. Um, and mostly that is they, they, they calculated wrong with the birth of Christ. So um, uh, what they thought was the year of Christ's birth, he was actually three years old, which is always a little fun. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, Again, I, I, I'm not someone that gets bogged down in the details. I want to give you the big picture. So it's right around 1500 BCE that 
uh, this formative period of the Exodus happens. And we see this in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And I have already mentioned that when, when, when Moses leads the people out. Um, and it's about, and again, um, you know, we know that they had 40 years in the wilderness, um, not quite sure how, how much time they spent before, um, but it's right around 1400 BCE that this is when they begin the conquest of the promised land and the settling. Um, and and that, that period actually goes on for, for quite a while. Um, I, I, uh, I always have a hard time wrapping my head around going time this way, but it, but it looks like they're, they spent about 350 years uh, in the promised land as a loose federation of tribes. Uh, that's when we hear about Joshua. That's when we learn about Ruth. Ruth is such an important story and a great example of how, even though so much of this time uh, of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy is about maintaining the pure identity of the people, uh, Ruth, a foreigner from Moab, ends up uh, becoming not only a part of God's people, uh, but becoming uh, an ancestor of David, who becomes an ancestor of Jesus Christ. So, so again, um, God's plan is bigger and, and, and broader uh, than what they thought. Um, this is when the dates start to firm up uh, from about 1050 to 930. Sorry, we're going to keep I'll put those in there right now so we have them. Um, this is when, this is that period, this is what we would call the golden years. This is the period when Saul starts the kingdom building process, David finishes it, and Solomon expands it. Um, this is that time period. Uh, and it's not, it's not a long, not a long period of time either, right? We're talking about 120 years um, before those, uh, before, first of all, uh, they split. So that's the split that I was telling you about uh, in 930 BCE. Uh, that's when they function as two separate kingdoms, uh, sometimes in conflict with each other, Israel, the 10 tribes in the north, Judah, the two tribes in the south. Um, and this is where, I, I also want to say as a resource for you, I, I listed the books that are covering these historical events, but here's when we start to see these prophets. And this is what's a little hard because I'm not quite sure what was the rationale for ordering the prophets the way they did in scripture. So I put them here. I've listed, so you see Hosea, Amos, and Micah, right? So they are prophesying um, when, uh, when it looks like those Assyrians are coming to invade, okay? So that's really the political issue of their day. And the theological issue is, where is God? These, the Assyrians are coming. What is God doing? Um, and um, so that, when you read those, it's, it's helpful to know that uh, the kingdom is already divided and the, the Assyrians are on their way. Um, the other two people that I want to bring up... Um, so Elijah and Elisha are prophets that, that the book of Kings talks about. So Elijah and Elisha don't actually have their own books named after them, but they're hugely important figures that tried to help God's people stay faithful um, in, in those turbulent times. Um, so in 722, that's when... The northern kingdom is invaded and destroyed uh, by the Assyrians, and uh, and they get really close, really close to getting the Judeans as well, uh, but they survive uh, for a little a little while longer. Um, I'm, it's so hard for me to do this math. About what 150 years, Judah continues. Uh, the Assyrians are taken over by the Babylonians, and then the Babylonians invade. And so that is when we, we, we have this experience of exile. And, um, and, and I'm sorry, this is, this is the, um, uh, 
I don't want to get it too far ahead of myself. So from 722 to 750 BCE, the Assyrians are, uh, the, the Israel is gone, but Judah is continuing. And I just want to point out, that's when the first 40 chapters of Isaiah are taking place. Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, and likely Joel. Um, and Josiah is the king in Judah in the midst of all these kings that are going astray. And accommodating the culture, Josiah uh, actually rediscovers the law, which is amazing, and executes the reforms that actually helps the people be faithful and survive a little while longer. Uh, but alas, in 587, uh, the Babylonians invade. And there's actually two invasions, which is a little tricky. There's one where they, there's one where they come in and kick butt, and then there's one when they come in and seal the deal. Um, and uh, but, but what I said is that that period of exile was such an important formative time. And what's really interesting is it's like it's barely 50 years, but it's so much a part of the consciousness of the people because it, it sealed the deal of nationhood. Right. There was sort of holding on the nationhood so long and then the exile seals the deal. And there is there's some really powerful uh, prophets that are writing during exile. Um, uh, Jeremiah uh, is is there when it's all kind of happening and lamentations. Um, and then, uh, and I, I tried to kind of distinguish, we have those that are writing sort of during the invasion, when the invasion's coming. And then we have prophets that are writing in exile. And uh, they're really, the view of God is getting deeper and broader. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at there for now. And then, um, and then we have this return uh, that we hear about, just a, a glimpse of it in Second Chronicles, and and really Ezra and Nehemiah talk about what life was like trying to rebuild, and it was really really hard, um, and they didn't quite reestablish. And then, as I mentioned before, Esther is a great story of Jewish communities after they've been sent into exile, some of those communities never came back. And Esther was a part of one of those communities abroad in the Persian empire. Um, and so in this period, I call it return, rebuild and anticipate. Um, and maybe return should have an asterisk because not everyone returns. Um, and that's gonna be really key for the uh, early Christian communities. So there's already Jewish communities that have been scattered. Um, and as I mentioned, it's the Persians that allow them to return. Alexander the Great and the Greeks come in for a while. Uh, and there are some, um, that's where some of the books, um, the Maccabees books, those of you from a Catholic tradition, we don't uh, include those in our scripture, but that's when the, that story takes place. Uh, and then the Romans come in. Um, so that's the big chunk of history. The, the New Testament is a lot simpler. Um, we have from 3 BCE to 30 CE, this is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, I just listed Peter and Mary and Martha as key disciples in that season. And then from 30 to approximately 120 CE is when, um, is th when the story of Acts is taking place and when these letters are being sent out. Um, and not to um, blow your mind any more than it already is blown, um, I may have mentioned this before, some of those gospels, right, most of those gospels were passed by word of mouth before they were finally written down. So for instance, um, some of the gospels were written quite a while after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus before they finally got written down, if that makes sense, right? So it might be 60, 70, 80 CE, right? Where Paul is starting writing around 52, 54 CE. So what's really interesting is if you look at when they were actually written, Paul is advising these church communities that already hear about Jesus and know about Jesus, and then the gospels are written down that, that, that have the written record. Uh, I hope that's not too mind blowing and I'm glad to unpack that more in the question and answer. But what I do wanna emphasize is these, these four themes that happen uh, with, with the, the, the word being spread. So first of all, 
God's people shift from a national identity, right? So it was started as a family, became tribes, became a nation, to a community in Christ. So one of the key themes that happens is it's much less about a national identity, about an ethnic group of people. And so what happens is they spread through the known world. They're interacting with diverse people and they're interacting with the powers that be in all of those contexts. And sometimes they're confronting those powers and resisting those powers and being thrown into court. And sometimes Paul's saying, you know what? Just do your job, keep your nose to the grindstone, be faithful. And it's really interesting to see how in the New Testament, um, uh, as they shift their focus from national boundaries and kings to a people spread around, how they engage power. Um, speaking of power, the last um, nugget that I do want to put in your brain is that in, in 66, oh ben, 66 CE, sorry, uh, Rome sacks and demolishes the temple. And really, that's the final nail in the coffin for the, the, the Jewish people sending them into diaspora. So some of them have already been sent abroad. Um, a bunch try to come home. And when that happens, the shift of Judaism changes for a long time um, from the temple to the synagogue. And, 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 and so God's people, the Jewish people, had been scattered. And so when followers of Jesus start spreading around, they actually, um, they often start with those synagogues. Sometimes they break off from those synagogues. Sometimes the whole synagogues are converted. Um, but in those early years, Christianity and Judaism are kind of bumping into each other. And, and some of that residue still still remains as as christians keep kind of spreading out and becoming more established and and jews sort of maintain this kind of close-knit community around their synagogue in lands that may or may not be hostile to them uh, to varying degrees um, so in the midst of all of that uh, the center shifts right the center was jerusalem jerusalem was the place and it shifts out um, you know, eventually for Christianity, it lands on Rome for the most part, uh, but even that is contended for a while. And, and uh, you know, the people of Israel only return to their land after World War II. Um, so um, so that, that's, that's some important historical dynamics that happen. And then just we wrap up the scripture uh, with Revelation written in a period of time uh, by a man named John in exile, but with a vision of God's people for the future. So that's, that is a vision of what is to come. Um, just to let you know, there were several books uh, that did not make it in here. Um, I also, I forgot Song of Solomon. Um, so these books um, have a little more nuanced connection with history. Um, some of them uh, refer to historical events, um, but also some of them kind of seem to stand alone in time. Uh, Ecclesiastes is pondering about life. Proverbs is pondering about life. Song of Solomon is attributed to Solomon, but it's about love. Uh, and, and Job is sort of about, about suffering, but it's not locked into uh, a specific time, historical time. Uh, and as I said, the Psalms is a collection of songs, but they, it's a songbook collected over years. So some of them do refer to historical events, and some of them are just about God's wonder or about our struggle, our hope, our praise. It's all about the human faith journey. All right. Thank you for hanging in there.